Cool. So I think Longfi has already covered some of these concepts. So I'll make sure to be conscious of everyone's time and add uh, the value wherever I can. Uh, but yeah, hey everyone, my name is Nandit, and me and my team we are building Lighthouse. And today I'll explain more on what's uh, we are doing with perpetual storage and programmable storage on FVM. Cool. So our vision at Lighthouse is to take decentralized storage to the masses, and how we do it is with perpetual storage at the core because I think this is something new to the table for cloud storage itself and can help us uh, differentiate from the existing cloud providers all across the world. And right now we have these SDKs that makes the job easier for developers to build programmable storage on FVM and then you can even go one step further towards storing private data and building token gated applications. So within our current suite of products, we have Lighthouse Files, which is a very easy to use interface that anyone can use, even a non-crypto native person can use. Then we have our Lighthouse SDK, which can be used to store data on um, IPFS and Filecoin, um, and then do programmable storage as well. And then we have a Lighthouse CLI, which is again a very convenient tool for developers, and then at last, we have a Lighthouse Coverage, which, which is our encryption and access control SDK. So a brief intro about our perpetual storage model. Essentially, uh, it's a set of smart contracts that we call as endowment pool. And it's uh, deployed primarily on Filecoin virtual machine. But for the right UX, uh, we'll be connecting to things like XLR to open up to payments from Polygon and other chains as well. And you can imagine it as a, a public good, which maintains and stores your files long term. So imagine before Filecoin deal expires, uh, endowment pool releases funds for um, the future renewal of your files. And then the plan is to integrate protocols like Glyph and some other DeFi protocols like Aave and Compound to have a way to even grow this endowment pool, which is common for all uh, the users and files. So yeah, the key. Uh, I would say core of this talk is about FVM. So we want uh, builders to build things like data DAOs, data derivatives, on-chain data insurance market, token gated dApps. Or you can use it for as simple as like storing your NFT and video data and have a verifiable and long-term proof uh, using FVM. So the first part uh, that we'll discuss, and I'll also touch docs a little bit, is uh, where you can just upload via our SDK, do things like deal making and also verify using a PODSI endpoint. The second point, the second part that we will discuss is uh, you can upload via smart contract and have a more like on-chain direct uh, way to upload the file where you have uh, like the right proof that this is the contract I'm interacting with. Uh, these are my deal parameters and how uh, the data is being stored. And custom RAS work, we have an implementation for that which Longfi has already discussed, so won't go much deeper into that. But essentially, um, if you see our documentation, these are some uh, very simple steps, which is like you can upload via Lighthouse SDK. So that could be very simple, like calling an upload function. And then uh, this was already there with us uh, before as well. But what we have done uh, new with the FVM is now that not only you can store your data, but you can also set uh, many deal parameters. And that can be something as simple as how many copies you want. Uh, what's the repair threshold? Uh, like, like what happens if a miner drops the file? What action has to be taken on FVM at that time? Uh, how should the files renew? And how and which miners to store your data on? So yeah, I think it just makes storage way more smarter. In Web3, we've been talking about smart NFTs, smart money. But finally, we have something called a smart storage which I think just changed the game. Like I haven't seen anything like this around in the Filecoin community from like last uh, three years. And like when I'm saying that, I mean like even outside that in the whole cloud storage world. Yeah, so you can actually input which SPs you want to make deal with. Like if you don't choose any, then it goes to some of the default that we have selected for you, which we think have good reputation. But you can put any SPs uh, which are right now on calibration network taking deals. Uh, like the test network of FVM, but in future it should be any SP as well. But 
So if you are asking like who makes the deal with the SPs right now, it's our client address. So you would want to interact and set which miners to store data on because uh, essentially if you want to make a deal directly, SPs have generally a limit that uh, minimum size that they want, that could be 32 GB. So I think this is something we need to work on. Like right now all the storage deals, independent of which SP you select, is made through our client address. Uh, but that's the plan in the future that even um, other clients can also use it. So then you might be willing to use your data cap, which should be cool. So that should be the next step after this. Hi, sorry, I missed some of the beginning. Um, and I had a kind of a follow on question with that. I'm not as technical uh, as you guys. I know that A North um, and, and some of that team are pushing some new FIPS that change sort of the, the deal market actor and kind of how that is structured. Um, and I know that there are various pros and cons to having you know your client ID, the, the Lighthouse client ID, be the one that's like you know brokering all of these deals. In the future, with this upcoming change to that that direct data onboarding, direct deal making, will it be more possible, or are there additional ways that you can kind of break out who that client is that is passing the deal through you as an intermediary through through Lighthouse, that is then brokering downstream to other SPs, so that dashboards and things like that could see a, a more discrete kind of behavior pattern on chain? Is that a future direction? Is that kind of out of scope? Is that maybe not critical in the work that you guys are doing? Does it, what, what are the sort of cons to splitting that out so that you could see more clearly? This one client is the one who's like doing the deal making through Lighthouse to a certain set of SPs. Yeah, so I think that's a very good question. Even right now, with our current implementation, when you store a file, uh, if you choose the smart contract route, which is the second route I will discuss after this, um, there's a record on chain on Filecoin virtual machine that this is the client, this is the deal parameters that they have set. And then we have the whole aggregation piece where uh, we'll be like aggregating your data uh, to make sure that the it reaches the minimum limit that miners accept. So I'm not sure about uh, like the deal market upgrade that you are talking about, but essentially even right now, if you interact with smart contract, it will be on chain. So yeah, somebody like Phil Fox or somebody, some other explorer can read that smart contract and then it will say you that, okay, like through Lighthouse Aggregator, uh, these are the clients listing the data. And then like for the simpler method, without interacting with smart contract, we have uh, our API endpoint, which you, you like, there's a trust element involved in that. Uh, but I see a value in what you are asking. Uh, but even right now you can do that on FVM, but it's hard to prove like what I would ideally love to see is that uh, can we use your maybe in future uh, fill plus or other data cap? Like you control that data cap, so you should be able to get a deal directly with the miners. Right. Yeah, that's like part of where this is coming from. Is sort of that idea of where where does the burden of diligence fall? One of the things that myself on the Filecoin Plus governance team, not the sole decision maker, but I care a lot about how we can have mm. these different aggregator pathways. I think they are totally within scope and should be supported by getting data cap. But there is this kind of ongoing burden of then who is doing the verification from a sort of liability and onus standpoint, right? If you look at, if we look at a, a, a clear use case of uh, illegal data that we don't necessarily want to subsidize and support on the chain, let's use that. If someone, if a bad actor comes through this system and you know, does not provide any diligence on who they are and tends to upload this illegal content and that content runs through your path portal, is given data cap, is sent to an SP, who is at, f at fault, quote unquote, for that behavior pattern? Would it have been Lighthouse for not blocking that client by performing the diligence? Would it be the SP for not checking the data they were taking from you? Is it everyone? Is it no one? And so those like kind of unhappy pathways are, are a place where we have questions and curiosity. Um, and I think that another, uh, another question that, that I'm, is related to that is like you mentioned working with different SPs. What is the diligence process for you guys in choosing those SPs when you when they make qualitative claims about their data center or where they're located or their 
SLAs that they could reach for upload and download or retrievability standards. Is that something that you have a process for? Is it just let's trust them and then start doing deal making and see what happens? Or do you use Phil Green as another mechanism for having Phil Green perform that audit to verify they are in a certain location or meeting a certain standard? What does that kind of relationship look like? So yeah, I think essentially right now how we are operating is like since this configuration is possible on calibration network, so we know like these are the miners who are accepting deals on calibration. So all the deals are going to them uh, when you choose it by default. Uh, but ideally where we want to reach is we don't even want to make a decision by that. Yes, I understand that many developers wouldn't even care about which miners they're storing. They just want a reliable service. For that, I think uh, if there is some team building something around reputations, we'll just choose, let's say, the top three to six teams, uh, three to six SPs that we store data on that we think have been like uh, like using something like field wrap or some other tools. Um, but down the line, I think we should not be um, arbitrating which miners to store data on. It should be you who select that. And that is right now possible on this calibration implementation. But uh, we will soon uh, move that on mainnet. Uh, but I do see a lot of value in an implementation like this. Just to add another point to this, so we are now also an aggregator. So there are, suppose, 100 users who, whose files are in one aggregate. So now, which client should initiate the deal? Which wallet address should initiate the deal? So since we have aggregated, so I think it's best that we initiate the deal. Which one to select among those 100? Um, this this discussion is great because it touches on building blocks in general for Filecoin and responsibilities that are being carried out by actors in the network that are not standardized in any way, that are not exposed through APIs. They're just responsibilities that lie on specific parties that are implicitly those like over time they have been. Like they've been concentrated on those parties, and we are having in a number of forums the discussions of right. How do we uh, create transparency in the system? How do we modularize those parts of the system such that uh, they can uh, they could be multiple implementations backing them, and users are free to choose like which one is going to fulfill, for example, the provenance stamping of like something, which one is going to fulfill the reputation, which one is going to fulfill the SP selection, right? And kind of like, you know, the probing of like, you know, quality of service of SPs and stuff like that. So I think in general, like we're hitting on this point and aggregators are going to be a critical piece in that because um, I think ultimately, if there is, if you think of Filecoin as having a set of standards, which then can be implemented by numerous implementations, uh, you can even consider a world in which, for example, say, for example, the end user comes in and gets authenticated somehow as being a real human, as having a particular desire, right? And this certification is awarded by some particular implementation of like that authentication flow, right? Um, and that lives on chain. And it can be bound to a soul-bound NFT, for example. So now the user presents the soulbound NFT to the aggregator to authenticate, to, to certify that they have been stamped by a particular system, which then the aggregator might decide to trust because you trust the provenance of like that system, right? You might implement a scoring algorithm for systems as well. So you, it might be like, you know, somewhat semi-trusted in that, you know, if there is like, there might be a feedback loop where like if there's a dispute or something like that, then you feed it back into your algorithm and like you start discounting the score of the system. And maybe you make that public as well. So therefore you create like a reputation system for authentication services, right? So like, you know, it starts building up in terms of like, we start thinking about how, what are the functionalities here and how you can package them up as open standards and expose them over open APIs that then can be composed by any actor in the system, that's really you know where I think we should be trending towards. So just rewinding for a second in this flow, imagine you have a soulbound NFT that represents like some authentication by some party for a specific user, then you no longer are involved in the decision as to whether this particular data, right, 
is allowed to go on chain or not. So that removes the burden from you. It places it on the right, like on, on a party that is specialized on carrying out that, that work. Of course, this adds friction to the user, right? There's one more extra step to get data on Filecoin. So how do you, how do you deal with that? Maybe in the future, we might have things like data wallets that make it super dead simple, where like maybe some, some of those factors of like authenticating a human or authenticating like, you know, a particular, like how genuine something really is, is, sorry, I'm just gonna come here, I guess I think I'm like, my back is facing a number of people. Um, so imagine like you have this, uh, like you, you might have the browser, you might be able to present a capture, you might be able to like, you know, use information from the browser as well to identify a particular user. Uh, if there is, for example, a Chrome extension that acts as a data wallet that has like a very easy path to like, you know, authenticating a user, boom, you, it's like an OAuth sort of like thing where you, for example, have a number of providers, you select, I want to authenticate with this, boom, this stamps me, like it runs its own proprietary checks, whatever it wants, right? And it stamps me, it gives me a soul bound NFT, which now I can present to data aggregators. Those data aggregators are deciding whether they allow my data or not. And they're presenting that soul bound NFT or like a signature with something on chain to tell the chain this data is actually allowed because this at this point in time, this certificate was presented to me in the context of this CID, which is then like proven later that it was that CID and no other CID that was uploaded to that data through a PODSI, for example. So like you complete the whole cycle of authentication of this user was considered genuine by some party. It uploaded a particular CID, right? I proved to the chain that it was that CID and not other CID that was uploaded because through PODSI, it was included in a deal and I proved it, right? And now I can feed back that information into the scoring model for that, for that system. So I'm just like, really riffing here, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think one of the things that you're touching on is like a thing that we care about a lot in Filecoin Plus, which is this idea of like, how do you ask upfront qualitative information and give an actor an opportunity to lie to you? And then how do you extend to them a line of credit and then mm. make deterministic, quantifiable, automated decisions based mm. on whether or not they did lie to you or not? Because you can never like, fully guarantee that you get it right the first time, right? It's like if somebody comes to you and wants to enter this system, they have to make some amount of claims that you have to take on some amount of trust, right? Like we are running a, we are running a service. So you have to assume that this person is an actor with data, but until you see that data, you can't believe them, right? In some way, you have to say, well, I don't know, drop a piece of your data here. Now I at least know you know how to use this interface, right? At least know you have some data. But you still can't prove the provenance of that data because they could have gotten it from someplace else. So there's all these like places where you have to take on a certain amount of assumptions of like trust, but then checking what those assumptions are and saying, well, once we entered here, we got this amount of qualitative or quantitative details about this actor from there, what assumptions can we start making about them? How much power do we want to extend to them? And what is sort of the onus and responsibility? If somebody shows up into a system like Lighthouse and says, I am claiming that I have provenance and ownership over these pieces of data, these CIDs, I am going to then OAuth in in some way so that you know I am a single non-repeated Sybil actor based on whatever your OAuth metric is. Now I'm going to follow the provenance of those CIDs throughout the entire network to any SP. And if I am a person who cares about the provenance of my data as a data client, it would be great to have some certification that I could go to and say, if anyone else wanted to claim this CID and claim that they own it, I have an earlier yeah. NFT timestamp, like piece of evidence that I can say, no, you did a retrieval, you downloaded this, you replicated it, whatever, like I am the original owner, here is proof positive. And in various like, you know, government level data aggregator systems, that is something that those agencies probably care a lot about. Mm. But probably talk about and also maybe take action on moving forward. Um, I'm going to let Nandit finish up yeah. the Lighthouse piece and then we'll jump straight into the further discussion on what we want to see for programmable storage coming up. Um, so yeah, cool. 
But yeah, just to add one last one, I think that SBT idea is pretty good. And there is this new ERC 6551, which makes NFTs as smart NFTs that can hold tokens. So what will be cool to see is like if client has a SBT where uh, there's a data cap token that they can spend with us. And then uh, there is some university that they are affiliated who can just sign and like give a provenance that, okay, you are actually the owner of this uh, data and that's in your that smart sold bound NFT. So that could be like an amazing concept uh, to be seen and then we can uh, spend that uh, data cap tokens towards SP. That could be interesting, super. But yeah, this is how a basic deal parameter thing look like where you can set number of copies, repair threshold, renewal, which minus to store data on the network, which is right now we support calibration soon mainnet. And I think just it just changes the game. It just brings uh, smartness to storage. And I personally haven't seen it uh, in many years. And not even traditional cloud providers do that. So it's quite mind-blowing concept. I would say as simple as that might sound. Um, and then, yeah, let's touch this last point here, which is proof of data segment inclusion. Um, so ideally what happens with Lighthouse, since we are an aggregator right now, and then soon maybe we should plan for being decentralized. But for now, when the user uploads the file, they can do that through a simple IPFS penning service or as an aggregator or use our aggregator node. And then what happens is, um, we aggregate their data into a larger file and deal and send a proof in a DB that we control right now. So which is this step number two. And after that, user can call a single API to get this proof back from our DB. Now till here, the point is centralized. Like you are trusting us that we aggregated your data, the uh, proof that we are giving you this inclusion proof, you are trusting us. But things changes when you go on the next step where now you can call a verifi verification contract, use the inclusion proof that you got from here and send it to this verification contract. And if it like works, like if it doesn't return an error, that means that the proof that we had in our DB and that we are showing you through our API is actually correct. So I think this is again also one step forward that yeah, we are aggregating, you are trusting us, but now you can also verify it. So I think uh, less decentralization up here. Um, so I wouldn't go to, into the RAS part because long fee has already covered that, but uh, I might, yeah. So I'll just take two minutes more on what else is happening at Lighthouse. So we release this uh, Lighthouse Coverch SDK, which is our encryption and access control SDK. And then you can store private data as well. And many teams are doing that uh, on Filecoin using Lighthouse. And something that we released just two weeks back, which is a mind blowing concept is that now you can connect your signatures that could be like calibration network, uh, your uh, like wallet with a pass key. So what that enables is now you would be able to access a encrypted file using your fingerprint and face ID login, which I demoed two days back on our client onboarding session. So I think it just makes the user experience because on my first slide, I mentioned that our goal is to take decentralized storage to the masses with perpetual storage at its core and making sure that all nearby elements are also there and we think encryption is an important part. And last but not the least, like um, I'll some, give a form where you can sign up for this desktop app, which is coming soon. It's already in testing on Mac, Linux and Windows. So like there's a discussion around block rewards going down. So I think many SPs are willing as we have talked to them, even market to their clients a very easy to use product that they can use to onboard. and. Uh, it just like a simple Dropbox as well uh, is very native to your system. You can just pull push all your data into that folder and it will just sync uh, back to first, let's say IPFS and then it goes to a Filecoin deal. So it just makes the overall user experience much, much simpler and we are building on our own SDK, which is great. But yeah, this is our uh, QR code to scan and to connect and show interest to any of our products that we are building, programmable storage, perpetual storage, and then these things around encryption and desktop app that I just showed. Thank you, sorry, I had a really quick question on that previous slide. Is that this? Uh, uh, the, just the desktop app. So uh, here, how much guidance are you giving to users or how much are you like obfuscating away from users as far as like encryption, sharding, like data integrity, best practices for mm. safeguarding their data? 
if yeah. a user is coming to your system and wants to like upload their files, are you doing like how are you doing like data prep or kind mm. of helping them make like a good safe decision with their data? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. like better way would be to show you what it how it works. I don't know if it will work right now. It's still in testing phase, but yeah, it's like as simple as what Dropbox is doing. So whatever you mentioned. You know me, you know this, I know this, but normal users doesn't know this. And that's the key purpose that uh, we are taking care of all the aggregation. And again, as I said, initially, it's like some of the miners that we are selected. But as we have got feedback from miners over the last two days, um, there should be a way where you can also select that I want my data in Australia, India, or let's say UK. But it is right now as simple as just uploading a file and let's say um, this file and it just like uploads the data. Like again, I'm saying it's in testing phase, so please don't mind the error. Uh, but yeah, this is how it works. So yeah, I've heard I've heard from some like different clients and things like some usability features that they would love to see as a value prop and coming to Filecoin specifically is kind of mm. data integrity and data security of their personal data, and so being able to like like you're saying checkbox for where it's going, but also mm. tooling to be able to say I want it sharded in this way you know, de-anonymize like this many times before it's sent to an SP, split up like in all these different capacities. Like if they have that kind of feature mm. of advanced settings, I think that looks like a really compelling difference of, a, of an offering um, because that kind of gets at sort of the, getting people that are in web two interested in web three is to like, ah, yes. A reason this is really cool is like, I can see where my data is going and I know that I have control over that data and how it's prepared and sent to people and someone else can or can't get it. I could make it in a way that someone mm. could access it if I wanted them to be able to, or I can make it in a way that it's like very secure. Yeah, I think we should definitely talk because that's on top of our mind right now. Yeah, uh, adding adding to that, I, I totally see the value of like having a one-stop place for users to um, upload the data, but also reason about like all the trade-offs of, the, of that data. Uh, one idea here to explore is some of this logic, for example, the encryption logic and so on needs to run locally, right? And specifically, there are some things like, for example, the sharding and kind of like the error coding and so on that are inherently going to be more trusted if it runs locally. Um, figure out like how you can provide, how you can create a proof that that work has been done correctly and locally uh, that can then be authenticated somehow, right? Because like I think what you want to definitely avoid in the scenario is like just the simple upload, like web to upload to a place, and then user needs to trust that. <laughs> nice. Uh, the user needs to trust that like whatever thing is happening in in the back end before it actually gets uploaded to the storage network, right? So like m think about how you can move that logic into the into the um, into the browser itself. And this is absolutely necessary for things like encryption, right? That's that's absolutely like required and dispensable. For other things, it could be done in the server side, but really, you probably want to like move as much logic as you can to the to the local. So one idea here is to actually use Wasm in the browser to provide different like strategies for error coding, for encryption, or whatever. You have access to the keys here. You just showed us. You know that extension with like passkey and everything, which is amazing. And I see there's like an encryption toggle, right? Yeah. So imagine like you know moving the encryption strategies, obviously like through Wasm modules, in the browser, and moving as well the error coding and the sharding, so that all that work happens locally in the browser. And the result of that work, it's what's actually uploaded to Lighthouse for safe storage into the Filecoin network. Just thinking about like you know how we can like continue moving offloading like you know what are usually like server side responsibilities in web two uh, into you know a self sovereign sort of like setting and and housing for them in web three. Yeah. Th Sorry, I think who provides that um, setup within the browser? Like, is that run by Lighthouse as well for the clients to run locally? So in this case, basically, Loudhouse, for example, would be creating a set of Wasm modules, right? A set of modules that then are shipped to the browser. Like when you open the Lighthouse app, right? Uh, you would, and like you open, maybe not the app itself, the home, but like, you know, 
the particular screens where this logic needs to happen, right? Maybe the upload screen. L Lighthouse, the web, the front end would go and fetch those WASM modules, right? Which are content addressed, they're open source. Maybe you can create an SDK here for developers to contribute their own strategies, right? Um, I'm giving you like great tips for Alpha here, by the way, <laughs> for product development. Uh, so you could uh, potentially create like an SDK for developers to upload their own strategy. Uh, there could be like a complete like build, deterministic build pipeline, right? That certifies that these modules are actually these particular CIDs so that when they are shipped to the browser for running them locally, the user can authenticate that the logic that it's received from the server is the correct logic. Of course, it can also fetch it from the Falcon network or Saturn, much better, right? Uh, because that's automatically content addressed or it should be, right? So then you have like this whole s certification that this encryption logic uh, is gonna like r that's gonna run or like this error coding strategy or this like you know sharding strategy that's gonna run mm -hmm. is uh, running in the browser and it corresponds to this particular logic that you can see here in this GitHub repo that is like completely open source and maybe it hasn't even been built by Lighthouse but by a particular client that really cares about a particular strategy of yeah sharding. Um, okay, so wait, this is a great discussion. Um, also, for everyone that just joined as well, uh, Lighthouse is one of our key aggregators platforms. Uh, the main one that is like working, uh, like functioning for hackathons and being used very popularly right now. Uh, so if, that's why we're deeping, uh, diving so deep into how that workflow could look like. Uh, I know we are also opening up for developer discussion at this point. Uh, we would like to get, include everyone in this room. So pertaining to Lighthouse, I'm going to change the screen for Nandit. So I'm going to open up all the other questions. Uh, if you have QR codes at your table and we will pass those around, that's where you can upload any questions that you have. Uh, there's also a voting system so we can see what questions that we really want to address. Um, we're going to open up to the floor and I'm, I'm going to give Galen the mic because I know he definitely has an opinion, and then we're going to open it up for the rest of the room to participate as well. Um, please do bear in mind that we have until 11.45 to have this discussion, um, and which has already been progressing, uh, and we are going to take all these notes and put it into a public discussion on GitHub. So um, yeah, start raising your hands and start getting included in the discussion. Yeah, I'll, I'll let you keep going with Nandi as well. Yeah, this, I just a, a short thing, like what Rose was just mentioning is like another great product developed monetization strategy where like these can be upgrade features behind a paywall and like thinking about ways to like upsell people on this. They can also be things that a, like another developer can then monetize and pay. And so you are the, yeah. like Lighthouse becomes a platform where other developers say like, I want to put my various like SDK encryption modules on there. And then there's a store where somebody's going and saying, oh great, my friend uses this one through Lighthouse. I'm gonna go microtransact and buy this particular plugin for Lighthouse that encrypts in a certain way and like you could monetize it in like a lot of different like types of streams where the baseline experience is this like great drag and drop decentralized backed by crypto super awesome but if you want more you can charge like a little bit from the downstream client who is like cares about this stuff and interest in paying for it yeah I think that makes a lot of sense for sure and then again like when we were building this desktop application um, like Again, our core focus right now is on developers and Web3 projects. But we were like, OK, why not build an end user application ourselves? So I think we are getting good response for various SPs as well who can use it and configure it for their own needs. Some want to use our encryption module, and some are like, oh, we want keys on our own system for those encryption keys. So yeah, I do see a value on what you are mentioning. And that could be like some another feature set. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>